You've spent a whole day traveling. Why are you subjecting yourself to memories of Mav? I don't know. I'm in like a special kind of mood today. But you know what? We're going to switch from this to something way more cursed. Michael! <laughs> Chat, this is the tar the, the, the time of stream, the part of stream, where we go over cursed journal papers! Ba -ba -ba -ba. Yep, it's time for- it's time for cursed papers. Um, we had testicle tanning last week. I'm, just, I'm literally not even gonna explain this. Here you go. I'm having a nice day, and I remember that there are actual researchers that got an actual grant that was approved by an actual ethics board that studied endometriosis. But instead of looking at something useful for a condition that takes, I don't know, 10 years to diagnose and affects 1 in 10 women, they use the money to do a study on how attractive women with endometriosis are. Pardon me. Pardon me. What are our priorities, man? This thing, by the way, it's real. It was published. And it was not retracted for like... Over seven years? They did retract it when there was- people discovered this paper in 2020. I'm gonna show it to you. I want you- I want to point out the giant... retracted on it? Are you guys ready? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Before we continue on with the rest of the video and the rest of this, like, seriously, seriously scuffed paper, I realize that a lot of the people watching this video probably don't know what endometriosis is. So, let me explain it first. Endometriosis is a condition suffered by one in 10 people with uteruses. And basically what happens is you have this lining on the inside of your uterus called the endometrium. And it's what thickens and sheds with each period. It's, you know, the bloody stuff. In endometriosis, that tissue or tissue like the endometrium grows outside of the uterus. And you might be like, Pum, where's the problem with that? Well, during your period, it still bleeds and sheds, except because it's outside of the uterus, just in your abdominal cavity, it has nowhere to go. So it accumulates within your abdomen and it causes really painful scar tissue. The end result of that is incredibly painful and often debilitating periods. And it can also result in infertility as well. This is really, really impactful on a lot of people's lives, including my own. I also have endo, which is why all of this is kind of incredibly relevant to me. But more importantly, there's not a lot of education about it, despite how common it is. And it takes on average 10 years for someone with endo to get diagnosed because of misinformation in the medical community about bad periods being normal. So if you or someone you know have debilitating periods, you might want to get that checked out because periods that incapacitate you are not normal. But that's enough of that. Let's continue with the rest of the video. A total of three, 31 of 100 women in the rectovaginal endometriosis group cases were judged as attractive or very attractive compared with eight of 100 in the peritoneal or ovarian endometriosis group. What the fuck? They weren't just saying, are women with endo more or less attractive? They were comparing women with different types of endo. Okay, yeah, you got these things growing on your ovaries? Yeah, you're hotter. Good job. It's like, what? It's talking about how like people might be more attractive for certain diseases, including diabetes, obesity, Crohn's disease, and hypertension. Why? To verify the potential relationship between endometriosis and attra attractiveness, and to substantiate a possible biological gradient between aggressiveness of the disease and degree of attractiveness, we designed a case-controlled study recruiting three groups of subjects that are women with deep rectovaginal forms, women with peritoneal implant and or ovarian cysts but without rectovaginal lesions and women without endometriosis. The degree of physical attractiveness, the main study outcome, was assessed by independent female and male observers. Yeah, I know this bitch be internal hemorrhaging, but uh, hemorrhaging internally, but like, question, is she hot? That is truly the most important question here. No, 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 we don't need to, we don't need to like look into like like, how you fix this, or what causes this? No, no. Is she hot, though? This was made by doctors. One, two, three, four, five doctors and a PhD. Thereafter, women underwent a physical examination by the two trained physicians, including weight and height assessment, measurement of hip, waist, breast, and under-breast circumferences. Once this overall evaluation was complete, 
other four different physicians, two females and two males, blinded to the women's preoperative diagnosis, but not to the study hypothesis, independently gave a judgment. It did not help. This is too weird. No, it's not statistically relevant. It doesn't help diagnosis. It doesn't help anyone. Well, there's another one. It's not quite as bad, but it's one of these things of like, why are we putting our time and money into this specifically? So remember, endo is severely under-researched. It affects one in 10 women and it takes usually around 10 years to get diagnosed, okay? It fucks up your life. You guys know this. I've talked about this before. Some of you were there for Ms. Lala's stream. It is a disease. Again, we need to research why it happens, how it happens, and how we treat it. And we haven't really done that. But on the other end of the spectrum, what we really should be asking is how do men feel? The purpose of the study was to assess the experiences of male partners of women with endometriosis-associated pain after medical treatment in their everyday lives. We conducted a phenomenological study based on semi-structured interviews with 11 male partners? Bro, they literally interviewed 11 dudes and they made a f***ing paper out of it. The interview men had been in stable relationships for a medium length of 14 years. They reported that they did not have information about endometriosis before their partner's diagnosis and that the endometriosis-associated pelvic pain suffered by their partners affected their personal, everyday life, marital relationship, sexual relationship, and intimacy. Oh no! Male partners of women with endometriosis-associated pain reported that this disease have both a profound impact on their lives and on their relationship. Oh, fucking boo-hoo, dude. Oh, what the fuck? 11 is not enough, peep. This was 2022. This was like three years ago. Boy, why did you, why? It's like if they did a study on like prostate cancer and asked like, but women, how do you feel about this? I met people doing research on potentially world-changing research that had to beg for grants. Like, I feel like a more legitimate study would be to ask the women, right? Ask the women how endo has impacted their, like, romantic lives, right? Because that's more of, like, a sociology thing, a psychology thing. And it kind of, like, goes into, like, the additional burden and consequence of having endo. But, like, to have, like, the perspective of, like, the dudes, it's like, but why? You're not the one suffering from this. I don't understand. Yeah, I guess it's rough to watch your partner suffer, but why do I need your input on this? It could have multiple impacts on the partner and have an insidious effect? Who wrote this intro? Chronic pelvic pain can increase tension in intimate relationships. About 8-10% to of couples affected by the condition reported separation mainly due to difficulties with sexual intercourse and infertility. However, most of the studies focus on women. Oh no. This must be a gap in the literature, right? We must fill this immediately. This is some trash, man. Why does it have to be endospecific? I guess that's like my biggest thing. Like, yeah, you could do studies on how partners of people with chronic pain are impacted and how like it affects relationships. But why specifically endo? How is endo that much different? From, I guess there's like the sexual component, which is why this matters, I guess. But like, how is it different from having like IBD or like anything else that might make it hard to, you know, engage. Um, I don't think there's anything else in this paper that, like, I care about. Okay, never mind, I lied. How do I f flip this? These are the 11 men that they interviewed for this. This whole paper is based off of interviewing 11 dudes. I don't know about you, that seems a little concerning. Oh my god, they, they show the answers. I always went with her to her consultations, even working at night, but in most consultations, you do not enter. Only here at this service, when my wife came to treatment here, is that I had a chance to talk about my doubts? What doubts? I'm assuming it's doubts about treatment options. It would be good if they invited the husbands to talk, to give support and more guidance. Okay, support? Sure. Guidance? What do you mean, guidance? Guidance on what? And that's up to the woman! It's up to her if she wants you there! Oh my god! 
for me is hard. You want to give attention to your wife, a sexual satisfaction to your wife who's feeling pain. I was controlling myself. It's hard when you know that it is a chronic disease without a cure. It is like a cancer and nothing can guarantee that a sur surgery will solve the disease. It's like a harmful herb that will always grow again. Maybe your wife doesn't feel like sexy times because she's in pain. Because the first thing I'd think about if my wife yeah. is in bed, feeling like pain is, how yeah. do we rock this bed? Yeah. What women would want to rock when in that much pain? Yeah, truly. When she was in pain, I did all the home chores. See, she spent a lot of time in bed because of pain. With my son, we took care of the chores. I'm just so confused about why this study is necessary. Okay, uh, what else? What else we got? I'm gonna see if I can find the boob one, and then we're moving on. <laughs> okay, so this one has graphs. That's an improvement. There's no pictures, so we're fine. This is educational. Oh my god, they used M-Turks. Hello, my name is Pomato, and today I'm gonna be presenting you a paper that's called Public Perception of Ideal Breast Shape. Um, it was made by a PhD, not a master's degree, MD, MD... PhD MD. Now, this is a plastic surgeon journal, so there might be some legitimacy to this. In the past decade, there has been a dramatic increase in the trends related to body shaping procedures. According to the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, nearly 300,000 breast augmentation procedures were conducted in 2019. Learning the ideal shape, shape of a breast and which aesthetics lead to public perception of the most attractive breast is beneficial to properly performing these procedures. Okay, they used a thousand M-Turks to collect demographic data and ask users to rank preferences. <laughs> For randomized image panels of breast proportions, holy moly! TBH. This must have been the best M-Turk task of all time. They literally gave you a bunch of picture of boobs and said rank them, and then they made money. 960 responses were used for analysis. A majority of the respondents were male, 60%. Actually, no, that's not as high as I thought that was going to be. With a plurality being 25 to 34 years old. Oh my god, chat, it's you! Chat! It's my primary demographic! Oh my god, chat, this is my demographic! The most notable preferences between all groups were breast projection proportion and nipple direction. <sighs> with preferences of a 1.0 and frontal nipple direction, respectively. Breast width to shoulder width ratio also had a clear preference among the crowd, with 105% being preferred to perce preferred percentage, and the 25 to 34 age group having a strong preference for this. Patients and surgeons disagree on what the ideal breast shape is, specifically for the shape of the upper pole. What the f*** is an upper pole of a boob? <laughs> Please tell me these are in the shop to match all, I beg. I'm now looking to see if I can find the picture of these boobs. There is a paper where they show this. Oh, wow. They literally, they showed a cartoon of boobs. I can't show this on stream. I'm so sorry. Even though it's educational, I cannot show. This is technically education. I can't show it. This is just straight up f***ing cartoons of boobs. I missed a very important part of this title. <laughs> wow preferences and frontal and lateral views multiple options oh <gasps> okay sorry pause i didn't see the sidebar i'm so sorry please don't ban me twitch i am doing education oh. you know if that's how i go down i do believe that might be my pop-off moment i don't want to go down that was a mistake but if i get bonked for accidentally showing titty in a paper titled, An Ideal Female Breast Shape in Balance with the Body Proportion of Asians? Holy f***, that's my pop-off moment. See you at the top, guys. What a great paper. Mm-hmm. This is a great paper. I love this. Well, honestly, we ended on a good note. Assuming I don't get banned, we ended on an excellent note. So I'm just gonna read this. the conclusions. The authors have showed the ability of specific crowdsourcing techniques to reveal the public's perception of the ideal female breast, which includes a front nipple direction, so pointing directly ahead, a breast project projection proportion of approximately 1.0, a moderately convex upper breast slope, and a lateral breast width to upper buttocks width ratio of 105%. There you go. I wonder if you pulled like, the VTuber population, how much different this would be. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ.